How do we know that the Bible is true? How can we be sure that there's one Bible and one truth when there's so many different versions and so many different manuscripts all over the world? How can we trust the Bible? I hear it has errors in it and it's full of contradictions. If God is so good, why is there so much evil in the world? How can a loving God send someone to hell? We're Christians. It's important for us to know what we believe and why we believe it so that we can engage with the world in conversations that are both captivating and effective to win people to Christ. All those questions and more will be answered this weekend at Revive. Amen, amen. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Bible. Amen. <laughs> Y'all have a good day. <laughs> this is the book that dares to predict the future. This is the book that dares to provide an explanation for how everything on earth works. From how it began to the first humans, to the first time sin entered the world, to the Messiah Savior, right down to how you got here. This is the book that doesn't just claim to be true. This book makes the claim that it is truth, by which all other truth shall be measured. But how do we know that it's really true? Can we really stand on its claims? We are going to take a look at some of the toughest questions that ever get asked about our faith. And I'm going to supply you with some very simple answers to those questions as we journey through defending your faith. We are Christians. And it's very important that you know what you believe and why you believe it. So that... You can engage with the world in conversations that give reason to why you believe what you believe and have those conversations in a very compelling, captivating, and engaging way to win people to Christ. We've got holidays coming up, Thanksgiving coming up. We're going to have a lot of family conversations, and you might get asked some questions that you're not sure how to answer. And so I want to arm you with some simple answers to some very complex, tough questions that you might get asked. Most of you have probably been asked these questions before. Why is it important for us to know how to defend our faith? Because reason demands that we do, and Scripture commands that we do. If you have a conversation with somebody who's an unbeliever, they're going to demand reason for why you have the hope in your life that you have. Scripture commands that we do it. Always be ready to give reason for the hope that you believe, says Peter. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your strength, all your soul, and all your mind. All your reason, all your logic. Love the Lord here as well. Paul said that we are to demolish arguments that come against God. How can you demolish arguments that come against God if you don't know how to have a conversation? Because how are we going to share our faith? What's the number one way that we share our faith? Through talking, through conversation. You've got to be armed with how to have these conversations. So one of the two claims that we're going to make in, in this message today, is if God exists and the resurrection is true, then Christianity is true, period. But people will come against the very existence of God, and they'll come against the truth of the resurrection. But if you can prove those two things right there, Christianity is true. And I'm telling you, we can prove those two things right there. We've been proving those two things right there. Uh, I was reading um, uh, a book by, by Greg Kokel, if anybody uh, loves to read and you like to read this type of stuff, he's a great author. Um, and... His little girl asked him, why do we believe that there's a God? And the answer was pretty genius to his little girl. He said, there are many 
worldviews that try to explain how the world works, many religions, many faiths that try to explain how the world works, there is no better explanation for how absolutely everything in our world works. There's no better explanation than the Christian view of, of how this, of how everything works. And the reason why there is no better explanation is because it's the one that's the truth. And I'm going to show you how to not only believe that in your heart, to know that you know that you know that you stand on truth, but also how to communicate that very effectively in a loving way to people who may not know it. Um, before I, I go any further into our message, I just want to encourage everybody. We are in this series right now that has been building. So if you've not seen the last four Sundays, you're not going to be lost today at all. But if you'd like to catch up with it, you can go on YouTube, Revive Church Longview, and you can catch up. Uh, where last week we... we started this, this, uh, this new uh, challenge to be able to have these communications. And the three weeks before that, I encouraged you, spend time with God every day to strengthen your relationship, your own personal walk. That's where spiritual growth happens, when you spend time with God. So go back and check those out if you want to. Uh, before I go any further, though, uh, this last weekend, we uh, celebrated something very, very important that I can't move any further along until I acknowledge all the veterans that are in this room right now. If you are a veteran, would you please stand up? If you were served in the military, are active, look at that, come on now. Praise God. Hey, y'all stay standing, y'all stay standing, please. Please stay standing. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Let me offer a, a, a prayer of blessing for you guys. Lord Jesus, Thank you for these men and women. Thank you that you've tugged at their hearts so much that they laid it all on the line and said, I'll stand, I'll do it, I'll serve. No matter what the cost, thank you, God, that you have tugged on our hearts enough that we will give something up drastically for the greater good and for other people and for our country, for God, for freedom, for truth, and for justice. Thank you for creating a group of people that are bold enough not to stand in this room right now, but to stand, to stand, sometimes to go in even when they don't know why they're going in. Lord Jesus, thank you for these men and women. Bless them, bless their families, comfort them in ways that only you can, encourage them in ways that only you can. In Jesus' mighty name, hallelujah. One more hand for our veterans. Praise God. Thank you guys for your service. Really appreciate, man, those are heroes. Those are heroes, man. Uh, I also uh, wanted to mention some, some other heroes. I don't know, something else that I think is pretty awesome. Uh, Sarah Mayberry had a training yesterday in kids' church. Uh, there were over 40 people that were signed up to go to this training. I wasn't at the training, so uh, I don't know uh, the final numbers or anything, but I know that that is a, a huge number of people coming to this training. Um, she set everything up. Uh, my kid, Jet, and, and the DeHart's kid, Brogan, when I picked them up from this, they were going on and on and on and on about how much fun they had, how much stuff they learned. They brought in a professional CPR team that trained all the people in kids' church how to do CPR. Man, come on. Good job, Sarah Mayberry. Excellent, excellent, excellent job. That was awesome. So you guys just want to, uh, to uh, share victories. You always have something to be grateful for. You always have people in your life that deserve honor. Lead with victories, lead with thanksgiving, honor those around you, and you won't be far off where God wants you to live. Amen. All right, so let's start with question number one. How can I know the Bible is true? Okay, so if you're taking notes, it's, they're, they're, these questions are going to be on the screen, and then the answers are going to be your, your responsibility to write down. Also, if you want to follow along, though, with my notes, everything that I'm looking at right now is available to you on your phone. If you'll go to the YouVersion Bible app. When you go to the YouVersion Bible app, bottom right, the three little things, click it, it's more. And when you click on more, click events, and you'll see Revive Church. Revive Church Longview, and you can follow along if you want to and have these notes. And if you save these notes, they'll be yours forever. All right? If you decide to make a book out of it or something like that, just give me some, uh, some reference or something. Share the love. Just kidding. God wrote this stuff anyway. All right. All right, here we go. How can I know the Bible is true? The Bible predicts the future. You guys, the Bible predicts the future not once, not twice, but hundreds of times the Bible has predicted the future with 100% accuracy. And the world, the world might say, well, the events of the world throughout history, they just happened by chance. 
All right, the, the, the Bible predicted it. That's just, that's just, it happened by, by chance. Uh, Jody gave me a book this week, and I read it, and one of the coolest things in the book was uh, how, can, how can you believe that all of this stuff has just happened by chance? So I have a quarter, all right? So I'm going to flip this quarter, all right, and I'm going to smack that down. How many of you guys say that's heads? Raise your hand if you think it's heads. All right. Raise your hand if you think it's tails. Cool. Raise your hand if you don't really care because it's completely random. All right. Okay. It's tails. It's tails. Why do we celebrate complete randomness? I'm going to do it again. All right. Bam. How many of you want to stick with your answer the first time? You're going to stick with it that it happened twice. It happened twice. How many of you guys, you want to change your answer to the other one? How many of you still really don't care because it's totally random? <laughs> it's heads this time. It's heads. All right. So in this book, it's called Share Jesus Without Fear. In this book, he offers the question, how many people would it take flipping this coin <laughs> before one person hits heads 30 times in a row? How many people, if I lined up a billion people and they all had a quarter and they flipped, do you think any, anybody? <laughs> or if I flipped this, if I sat here all day long, what are the chances that I would hit heads 30 times in a row? Almost nothing. Like, really, none. It's completely random. How can we put faith in something that's that random? Um, that's that co- so my point to that is there are over 30 scriptures in the Old Testament that are hundreds, some thousands of years before Jesus Christ was born that predicted the birth, the ministry, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. And it happened exactly how it was predicted hundreds and thousands of years, hundreds of years, and even thousands of years before Jesus was even born. Believing that that is random, that that's just a coincidence, is like believing that I can flip this quarter 30 times and it land on the same thing. It's absolute nonsense. There are just a few things that Christ himself uh, lived up to or whatever. Um, like I said, over 30. Here's a few. Okay, show those few. Okay, if you're, if you're taking notes or whatever. Okay, so these are all uh, hundreds of years. Some of these are 700 plus years old before the Messiah came. The scepter will come through Judah is one of them, which means the royal line. The royalty will come through that line. That happened. David's offspring will have an eternal kingdom. That happened through Jesus Christ. A virgin will give birth, and he'll be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. That happened. The Messiah will come out of Egypt. That happened. The Christ will be born in Bethlehem. That happened. The Savior will be called a Nazarene. That happened. How in the world can this stuff be random? You can't pick where you're born, where your family takes you to when you're two years old. You can't pick this stuff. This is what happened that fulfilled all these prophecies and many, many more. How can, how can one guy be from Egypt, Bethlehem, and Nazareth? That's impossible, but it happened. And we're going to get into the, the Jesus birth story as we get closer to Christmas. My absolute favorite time of the year. My very favorite thing to preach on is the birth of Christ and this Christmas holiday season. It's amazing how can those three things just right there happen. They did happen. It was planned, it was predicted, and it was ordained by God. One of the reasons why we know this is true is because of how many predictions that it made that have all come true with 100% accuracy. There's no way that this stuff happened by chance or coincidence. So, okay, how many people do you think it would take flipping a coin before it hit heads 245 times in a row? I mean, it's impossible for it to be, it's just not going to happen. It's not going to happen. But there are over 245 scriptures in the Bible that predict stuff that all have come true. They've all happened. And, and here is just some that Jesus himself, like, so I, we can't go over all, you know, 200 plus um, prophecies that have all happened but you want validity in a book? 
I mean, what else do you need? Here's the stuff that it said thousands of years ago. Here's the stuff that we have seen happen since it said it over and over and over, over 245 times. Here's the stuff that just Jesus himself said in his ministry. Go to the next one. Um, all of the disciples would leave him, did they? Yep. He said Peter would deny him three times, exactly three times before morning came. He did it, and he said, no way, that's impossible. It's never going to happen, and it happened. All right. Um, he would die in Jerusalem. That happened. He would be crucified. That, he knew all this stuff. That would happen. He would die during the Passover. That happened. He predicted all of this stuff, and it happened. His resurrection from the dead would come on the third day. I mean, I mean, even like just pretend that, it, that it's normal that you predict the city, the location, the time you're going to die, and who's going to betray you. Predict what day you're going to come back to life on. And then follow through with it. Because Jesus made these claims. If Jesus didn't come back, Christianity's dead. But the resurrection did happen. How do you know that? I'm going to get into that. We're going to dedicate all of next week to the resurrection. I did a sermon one time called Resurrection Proof. There are so many proofs, so much evidence, so much evidence, one after another, that this actually happened, even outside the Bible. This is historically, accurately documented. All right, even the, over 500 people even saw him and walked with him and touched him and talked with him after he died, after he came back to life. Okay, so I'm, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but he, he predicted this, and he predicted the coming of the Holy Spirit. He told them. He said, hey, it's better for me that I go on up, uh, into heaven so that I can send you the Holy Spirit. And then fire fell from heaven, and flames just engulfed them, and they all started speaking with power that they had never known before. It's a phenomenal historical event. It's not a story. It's a phenomenal story. Well, stories can be fairy tales. This is a historical event that took place and is documented by not only the Bible, but people outside the Bible as well. All right. So, uh, okay. Oh, you know what? There's, there's even more. Okay, I'm just going to run through them really quick, okay? Uh, the destruction of the city of Jerusalem within one generation. The temple in Jerusalem would be destroyed. It, it did. It was. The people would be scattered. They were. The Holy Land would be ruled by Gentile, Gentiles. It is. The Jewish people would be gathered back together. They are. Though persecuted, the nation of Israel will survive. These are all, th this is just Jesus. There's 245 of these things, and they all have come true, okay? So that's one, one way that you can know that the Bible is true, because, of, because it's the only Bible that has dared to predict the future that is 100% accurate. Okay, question number two. How can you believe in one Bible, and it's the sole truth when there are so many different versions and different manuscripts of this thing all over the world? You ever heard that before? Maybe some of y'all have even been asked that. I have been not just asked that, but argued with. I've had people say, there's no way that the Bible is accurate. There's no way it's true. There, how many different versions of the Bible are there? Different translations, different manuscripts all over the world. I mean, just in this room right here, raise your hand if you, if you carry a good old King James version of the Bible. There's some old school folks. Yes. All right. Uh, raise your hand if you carry uh, the ESV, English Standard Version. Good, tried and true. All right. Raise your hand if you carry the NIV. Yes, lots of folks. NIV. How about the NLT, the New Living Translation? Yes, 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 yes. All right. How many of you uh, carry the message? We'll pray for you after the service. All right. Anyone? Anyone? All right. That's good. That's good. All right. Uh, I'm kidding. The message is great. It's, it's just more of a story. It's more of a commentary than it is an actual translation of the Bible, but it's, it's good. It's good, too. All right? It's like how we talk, you know? Like you go from the King James Version, and you're like, thou shall not commit murder. And the message is like, yo, 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 homeboy, come here, let me holler at you for a second. Yeah. Don't be killing nobody. You know what I'm saying? All right, let's move on back. That's what the message is. Like, what is that? All right, cool. <laughs> you know, you can, on the Version Bible app, you can, have, you can have it read to you. And you can have it read to you in different dialects and stuff. And there's one on there that plays hip-hop music in the background and talks like a street dude. Yeah. It's, it's like if you want Jermaine to just read the Bible to you, he's on this app. He's on this app. You know? <laughs> I listen to it every once in a while. Like, I always think of Jermaine. I just imagine Jermaine's right next to me having some coffee. Like, yeah, what's up, Pastor? What's up? We're going to go over Psalms this morning. It's going to be good. It's going to be good. 
<laughs> and he's got this little track and it just it's awesome the bible app is great man all right <laughs> uh all right so check it out so how can go back to the question here's the answer how can we believe in one bible and it's the soul truth there's so many different versions and different manuscripts all over the world man Ironically, it's the different versions and the different manuscripts that prove it even further and make it so much more reliable. Imagine if there was only one scroll. If we had the original scroll that Paul wrote to the letter to the Romans on, and we had the original one that was guarded by one committee or one person, some king somewhere, he could alter that thing to any way that he wanted to, and he could make it look just like the original document. But because there are thousands and thousands and thousands of different translations and different versions out there that all say the same thing, we can know with much more accuracy and confidence that what they're saying is true. For example, does anybody still read the newspaper? Raise your hand if you still read Come on, Terry Pickard. Dude, wait a minute. You're the only one in here. That's crazy. Your daddy or Billy? Brother Billy and Terry. All right. Also, ironically enough, the carriers of the King James Version of the Bible as well. Awesome. So, okay, so check it out. So at least if you're my age, you at least know what the newspaper is. All right. Um, and so <laughs> Jet and Brogan, and, uh, they may not know. Even, they've never even seen one. I don't know. We used to light fires with, but um, that's about it. But, okay. So imagine if... USA Today uh, came out, and you read, and you're like, I don't like what it says. It doesn't fit my, uh, my, my desires anymore. Like society changed or whatever. I don't like that article. It's not PC anymore or whatever. In order to change that, how hard would it be, how impossible would it be to change that? Because of all the different copies and all the different versions, it's in all the different languages and all, you know, like the Wall Street Journal or, or the New York Times or whatever. How many, like you'd have to go to every single newsstand that sold this paper and pick up every single copy and change all of the copies. It's impossible. That's actually why the Bible is accurate. That's why you can place your trust in it. Because all these versions and manuscripts and all these different languages from around the world all say the same thing. And if you got them all together and one was different, it would stick out like a sore thumb. Now, if anybody's like, yeah, but, you know, if you're reading in Greek or English or whatever, the language is different. Yes, it is different. Okay, but that doesn't mean it doesn't say the same thing. Um, like, I, I can say something to my, my wife um, that in different ways, but it means basically the same thing. Um, I can look at her and go, ooh, girl. Or I can say, you look really hot today. They both say the same thing. All right. Uh, they both get me a shuggy, maybe. All right. <laughs> but the different versions saying basically the same thing further proves the validity of these events. Okay, so if you're writing these down, you're going to be armed and ready to, uh, to talk to your, your relatives when they sit around at Thanksgiving. All right. All right. Next question. Okay. So, but, but what about the errors in the Bible? And it's full of errors and contradictions. How can we trust this if it's full of errors and contradictions? Okay. It, people are like, that's a, that's a real thing. I've, I've sat in debates and arguments with people like, this thing is full of contradictions and errors. And what they're insinuating is, if it has errors in it, if it's full of contradictions and errors, it can't be true. Therefore, Christianity's false, and your whole foundation for what you believe just catered, just fell through the floor. All right? Cratered, not catered. All right. That wasn't the right word. All right. So, uh, <laughs> your whole belief system just brought people food. All right. Uh, it's a different word. Okay. That's what people are, are insinuating. So the first thing that I would say, and I'm fixing to arm you with quite possibly the single greatest phrase that you can say to anyone if they come against your faith. All right, here it is. What do you mean by errors or contradiction? What do you mean? Okay, so for example, if someone ever said, man, the Bible's full of errors, 
There's no way that Christianity is true. And your faith, I'm not going to believe in, the, in your God or believe in the Bible. It's full of errors. If you will just say, what do you mean by errors? And shut up. You'll win 80% of the conversations. It, it, it works with politics too. All right. I'm not going to get myself in, in trouble or paint myself in a corner like I did last week. But, uh, but like, if somebody says, I can't tell you how many times during Trump's administration, I heard people say, oh, I hate Trump. I can't stand Trump. And then somebody else would say, why not? Like, why don't you like him? They have nothing. Uh, you can do the same thing with, with uh, Biden. Like, oh, I hate Biden. Why? What do, you, what do you mean by that? Well, he's just the worst president ever. What do you mean? What has he done that you hate? 80% of the people cannot answer that question. With No matter who the, the leader is at the time. You've just heard something that thought sounded good, and you just adapt that and jump, jump on board with it. Now, for those of y'all, <laughs> I saw a few of y'all nudging and looking like, I know exactly why I don't like Joe Biden. <laughs> It's not for you, all right? It's for other people. It's most people don't. Most people don't. They really they can't have a conversation about that. You know, whether it's Trump or whether it's Biden or whoever the next one's going to be, it doesn't doesn't matter. Um, it's true, but it's certainly true for the Bible as well. What do you mean it's full of errors? Give me an example. You'll hear crickets. Conversation's over. You won. <laughs> all right. But let's let's move on. What if, they, what if they, they can't? Okay, so you could say, what do you mean it contradicts itself? What do you mean by a contradiction? Give me an example. Because what you've done is now you've put them in the hot seat, so to speak. They're the one that made the claim, so make them give reason for their claim. You're not in the hot Most Christians are afraid to engage in these conversations because you're afraid to be in the hot seat. You don't know how to navigate this. Don't be in the hot seat. Throw it back on them. All you have to say is, what do you mean by that? Now you flip the whole conversation. They now have to justify and prove their reason. Your reason's true. And the truth really never needs to defend itself. So relax. It's okay. You can engage with, with the world, and you're going to win. Um, but it's not really about winning and losing anyway. It's just, I told you guys a couple weeks ago, you're not trying to convert everyone you talk to into Christianity right there on the spot. You just want to put a little, little stone in their shoe. Just plant a seed. Just kind of make them walk away going, huh. You know, I really don't know if there's errors in the Bible or not. And you'll make them think. And then, and then maybe Bonnie comes along and, and, and she's at a restaurant and that same person talks and then she plants another seed. And, and they're like, wow, this dude that I met last week, he planted the same seed. God must be talking to me. That's how this works. That's how this rolls. That's how this flows. So you don't have to take on the sole responsibility of, I don't know how to convert someone. You don't have to. But you know how to say, what do you mean? Everyone in here can say that. One, two, three. What do you mean? What do you mean, what do you mean by that? All right? Um, so you'd have to look at each, each one. Like if they make that claim, okay, look at each one and, you know, and figure it out, know enough about the Bible to go, that's not really uh, an error, that's not a mistake. I see how you think that, but okay, so that takes some reading and some studying and stuff. Um, but most people, when they say there's contradictions in the Bible, what they really mean, they mean there's differences in the Bible. So this is arming you, this is something you can say, because most of the time that's what people mean. If they say the Bible contradicts itself, you say, well, what do you mean by that? Do you mean that there are differences in the Bible, because there's a difference between a difference and a contradiction. The Gospels, the four Gospels, they say different stuff about the same event. And you will have people say the Bible contradicts itself. Uh, because they're given the same account, but they're saying it different. And this person says the per first person to the tomb was this person. This person says the first person to the tomb was this person. This person said when they came to arrest Jesus that... They just knew who he was. This person says, no, Judas betrayed him with a kiss. And, and this account of the gospel says uh, that, uh, that they did this. And this account says that they did this. Um, she she washed, washed his feet with her tears and her hair. And another version uh, doesn't mention that at all, but just mentions the event. So which one happened? Um, well, it, 
which, which, which one of them's right. These are differences, not contradictions. When someone attacks the Bible saying it contradicts itself, when you know there's actually just differences, what, what it's doing is actually what exactly we would expect it to do if you took four different people, pulled them aside, interviewed them one-on-one, -on -one, separated from one another, and they gave you the eyewitness account of what happened. If all four Gospels lined up identically, which is what the person is trying to make the claim when they say, no, it's, it's full of contradictions. You know, in Mark it says this, in Matthew it says this, in Luke it says this. If it, what they're saying, you want all four of them to line up identically, exactly, there would be a big reason to believe that's false. If, if something happened and officers were trying to get to the, to the bottom of what happened and they pulled two eyewitnesses out or four eyewitnesses out and asked them what happened, they would expect that the details are different between each four eyewitnesses, but, but the essentials are the same. That is exactly what we have. That is a normal worldview. People put the Bible on, on this uh, like edge of the sword type of thing, but that's exactly how we think. We we apply stuff to the Bible that we don't apply to our normal everyday logic. Um, like, like if Jet and Brogan and a couple of their friends, they, they said, can we, can we walk down to the park in the neighborhood? Sure, walk down to the park. And when they came back, something has happened. And they're just going at it and going at it and going at it, and they're talking, talking, talking. And I'm like, okay, hang on, hang on. What happened? And Brogan tells me what happens, and Jet tells me what happens, and the other two boys tell me what happens, and it's exactly the same thing. They're lying. <laughs> they got their stories together. They collaborated. They rehearsed it, and they went in with this. But if Brogan says something, Jet says something, the other two fellas say something, and it's in general, they saw a lightning bolt strike a tree, but... One of them said there was a rabbit there. One of them said it was when Brogan was shooting his three-point, you know, it was somewhere. I don't know, but lightning struck the tree. All right? So the difference in a contradiction and a difference in the Bible is what typically you can, you can uncover if you ask, what do you mean by that? And then point out differences are not the same thing as contradictions. Um, the 1912 sinking of the Titanic, when eyewitnesses report that, uh, some eyewitnesses reported the ship sank whole. Some eyewitnesses reported it broke in half and sank like that. Some eyewitnesses say that it sank this way instead of this way. Which one's true? It sank. They're all true. All right? Now, we all know the truth because we saw the movie, but they didn't get to see the movie. So... <laughs> All right, but here's the kicker to that. Even if there are differences, even if really if there are uh, mistakes, it doesn't disprove the main event. Just because they think it broke in half and this person thinks the Titanic say doesn't disprove the event happened just because there are differences, okay? Um, Rose still promised Jack she would never let go, and she let him go. There was plenty of room on that big floating door. Mm. All right. Next question. Okay, here's another one. How can you really trust it? It was written by man, and man, men, people, humans, make mistakes. How can you, is that number one? Okay. How, how can you really trust this? It was written by man, and man makes mistakes. Come on now. We're not applying the same logic to this as we apply to every other thing in our lives. And don't let people get away with that. Don't let them put you in the hot seat of having to prove this or, or analyze this. And, and, and you get scared because you don't know that much knowledge about it that you can defend every word of this Bible. Man, you're not supposed to try to defend every word of this, this Bible. Bible scholars that have been studying this their whole lives don't have the whole thing memorized. Don't play that game. You throw it back to them. But how can we believe this is true? It was written by man and it has mistakes in it. What do you mean by mistakes? 
Even if you did find an error, though, does that really mean the Bible's false on what it's essentially teaching? There's a guy named Gary Habermas who's written more about the resurrection of Jesus than any other person in history. He's written tons of books. His latest book is 5,000 pages on this subject. He is the foremost authority on the Bible and the account of the resurrection. And when people come to him and say, I found a mistake in the Bible, do you know what he says? So? So what? Even if you're right, that doesn't disprove all of Christianity. That's what the world back, tries to back Christians up in the corner. Like, if I find a mistake in your Bible, I disprove you, your king, and everything that you believe in. That's not true. Where do we come up with that? If I'm watching the Texas Rangers win the World Series, what? All right, if I'm watching that and I see a mistake on the scoreboard, all right, it says it's the top of the eighth, it's really the bottom of the eighth or whatever. Do I immediately jump to the conclusion that ESPN is wrong, the entire website is wrong, the whole news station is wrong that's reporting this, and the Rangers are a total uh, fabrication? No. So what if you find a mistake in the Bible? That doesn't make Christianity false any more than it, than it makes a website false if you find a mistake in it. It doesn't tear down the whole belief system just because you find a mistake in it. Which, just a little side note, there are no contradictions in the Bible and there are no mistakes in it. Just a little side note. But that's not your arguing point because now you took the hot seat and now you've made the claim and now you have to prove that claim. But if you throw it back and say, what do you mean by mistake? They have to prove what they're talking about. And most people are dumb as a bag of bricks and they can't do it. I'm just playing. <laughs> I'm kidding, just serious. All right, so uh, I'm, just, I'm just playing. But don't let people back you in a corner like that. I found a mistake. So what if you did? So what? People have this idea, it's a false idea, that if you find one error, just one fault or minor discrepancy, that even if it's not really an error but you think that it is, that suddenly everything in this Bible must be false? Where do we even come up with that? That's nonsense. It was written by man. Man makes mistakes. That's why you think this is false? Because it was written by man? Well, we all know as Christians, it, yes, men actually put the pen to the paper, but it was inspired by God under prayer. Some of them were prophets. A lot of them were prophets in a whole different state of mind than, than we live in. Okay, so it was divinely inspired, and they just wrote God's word. However, you don't even have to go there with them, even though you could. But that it was written by man, so you throw the whole thing out the window is complete nonsense. Don't let people get away with that when they're having a conversation with you. All right? What do you, what do you mean it was written by man? If they're a college student or they're a high school student and they have their backpack on, they're like, hey, do you have a textbook in your backpack? Do, do, do you have to, are you responsible for the, for the knowledge that's in that textbook? Yeah, you are. You're going to be taking the... You're gonna, I mean, the, where I was going with that is that, yes, they're going to ask you for your knowledge of this on a test. They're going to test you on the knowledge of this textbook. You, so do you just throw the whole thing out the window? No. You believe the validity of this textbook because of the credibility of this textbook because you know you're going to be tested on it. Have you ever read a book, period? Have you ever watched a YouTube video? Wasn't it created by man? You ever learn something from anyone? It, it, it's nonsense that, that people would attack you in this way. If you're going to attack me and my faith, you better bring it with a whole lot more than this. This is very immature, unintelligent arguments. Do not say that to people. <laughs> Especially if you are at the dinner table with your family at Thanksgiving. All right. No, no, no. The, 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 the idea here is not for us to win and be all high and mighty and we can beat anybody in any argument. You lost if that's, your, if that's your motivation. Motivation is to be so attractive to them in the way you talk and communicate. In your engagement with them, it's captivating, engaging, 
effective, and they find you and everything you're saying so attractive, they lean in and say, tell me, about, tell me a little bit more about that. How do I get what you've got? How, how, did, how did that healing take place that I heard about? I thought it was nonsense, but now I want to know more about it. That's your goal. And if you get angry or mad in a conversation, you lost. And, and honestly, if anybody gets angry or mad in a conversation, you lost. But you can't always determine, you know, you can't control their, their behavior. Okay, so, so what if it was written by man? I mean, I could go on and on about the Bible itself, but let's move on to God. I wanted to tell a little bit about the Bible, but let's move on to God himself. Okay, how do we know that God exists? You guys, I can prove to you that God exists just by looking at the stuff that we do know exists, that we observe in our everyday lives. Okay, how do we really know that God exists? By looking at stuff that we really know. All right, so next question is, if there is a loving God, why is there so much evil in the world? That's one of the biggest questions that we get. If God's so loving, why is there so much evil in the world? And the short answer to that is, there can't be evil without God. That there's evil in the world proves the existence of God. And let me walk through and explain myself to you so that you'll know and you'll be armed. Okay? If he's so good, why is there so much evil? Why do bad things happen to good people? That's the same question phrased in a different one way. So if anybody asks you, here you go. Here's a little, here's a little weapon for you. I'm going to arm you. Here's a weapon. Don't fire it. Just have it in your quiver. If anyone asks, hey, why doesn't God stop all the evil in this world? Say to that person, well, if he stopped all the evil in this world, he would probably start with you. <laughs> yes. Yes. Again. Don't fire that one. Just have it back there if you need it. <laughs> but what's crazy is anytime somebody says, why is there so much evil in the world? What they're saying, like, why didn't God get rid of all this evil? They're never talking about themselves. They're always talking about somebody else. Right? Like when people complain there's too many people, you're one of them, dummy. You go to like amusement parks or anywhere in L.A., you know, and you're like, there's too many people. You're like, well, if you would stay home, there wouldn't be so many people out here, right? Right. So it's, people always assume that evil is somewhere else. It's never themselves because everyone thinks they're good. But the Bible clearly tells us nobody's good. That's why we need God, because nobody's good. If God decided to stop all evil at midnight tonight, would you still be alive at 1201? And all y'all went, well, yeah, I would be. You wouldn't because you just lied in church. <laughs> all right? We, here's, all right, we have evil because God allows us to have free will. And we're allowed to have free will because there's no way to love without free will. God allows us to love. You cannot make someone love you. If I force you to love me, that is not real love. Right, right. Love can only come by your choice to open up your heart to someone, to surrender your emotions to someone, to give someone a little bit of power over your life. Did you know that's what you're doing when you say, I love you? You're willingly giving them power in your life, so be careful. Yeah. Some of these young kids, they start dating somebody in the next Instagram or Snapchat is hearts and I love you and I'm so grateful that God brought you in my life. You're 14. Stop doing that. Give it a minute. Give it a minute. Let it breathe. Let it breathe. All right. Cool. All right. You only have love. God wants us to love him. If you could sum the Bible up in one word, what would it be? Love. You can sum the whole thing up in one word. It'd have to be love. God gave us the greatest gift and the greatest, most powerful thing on this planet. It's love. Love can only come from free will. Unfortunately, when you give people free will, not everyone chooses love. Some choose evil. They can't choose evil without having first been given the option to love. Who gives us the option to love? Who gives us free will? The answer to evil being in the world, you guys, is Christianity. 
There was Adam and Eve. They were, they were communing with God. Everything was perfect. And then God left them alone for a minute and allowed them to choose. They could choose love. They could choose staying with God. But they chose separation from God. They chose to believe a lie. They chose to believe the world whispering in their ear something a little bit better than what they thought God could offer them. And they took it. And that separated man from God. And the answer to us being reconnected to God after that sin is Christianity. That is the answer to the evil in the world. God finally sent his son and said, hey, all you sinners, it's true that none of you are good. From this day forward, we're not even going to measure your ability to get in heaven by obeying enough rules and regulations, rituals and religion. I'm going to give you a free pass, and his name is Jesus. That's how that went down. We have free will so that we can love. Some choose to do evil with that, and that's called sin. God knows no sin. So any sin separates us from God. Hey, let's get some keys. JB, come on. All right. Any, any sin separates us from God. The solution to get back to God is to be reconciled with God. God's answer as to how we do this is Christ. So from Genesis on, the story of mankind was separated from God, and God pumps his whole lifeblood into mankind trying to get back to them until finally sending his son to save humanity once and for all by taking that sin all upon himself so that the burden isn't on you anymore. So to the atheist or skeptic who says, there can't be a good God because all of the evil in the world, the first thing you got to say is, what do you mean by evil? And they're going to start giving you examples of evil. You know, murder and rape. And you say, no, 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 you're giving me examples of evil. Give me a definition of evil. And it's impossible to define evil without making some sort of reference for good. There must be a standard of good for you to measure evil. And the second they define evil by using a standard of good, here comes God. They can't do it. With, you can't acknowledge evil without surrendering to God. You can't do it. Okay, so they'll still try to do it. All right? Evil doesn't exist unless good exists, okay? Evil is like cancer. You can take all the cancer out of a body. You've got a clean body. But what happens if you take the body out of the cancer? It doesn't exist. It doesn't even make sense to say. Like rust on a car. You can take all the rust out of the car. And if you do, you have a better car. But take all the car out of the rust? That doesn't make sense. Evil only exists because good exists. Evil is the lack of good. And when someone says there's too much evil in the world, you know what they've actually given evidence for? God. When someone says there's too much evil, they're actually giving evidence for God. Because that evil exists means that good has to exist. And if good exists, God must exist. Because that's the standard. Without God, you have zero moral compass for good. Without God, everything is just someone's opinion. We can all agree on certain things being evil. Like, we can all agree that Hitler, the Holocaust, murdering millions of Jews, that was evil. We can all agree. All right? Other, other things. All right, I, I came up with the example of, of like, if you do, like, it, I enjoy punching babies in the face. I just, it's, it's fun for me. I just enjoy punching a good baby. You know, just, just a good punch to the... We'll all agree... That's not cool. <laughs> Why? If there's no standard of good that you can point to as to why that's wrong, it's just your opinion over Hitler's opinion. I can punch your baby if I feel like punching your baby. There's no standard of good. Now, that's a silly little example, but you understand what I'm saying? Like, there must be in all, like you can point to Hitler and the Holocaust, people do that, but you can point to everyday stuff. There's no standard of good. 
if there's, if there's no one creating the standard? Who says that it's wrong? But we do have a standard of good. When I said, I enjoy punching babies, y'all all got really weirded out. You giggled and you laughed. and like, The reason why is because you may not, someone may not know that God exists, but you do know without a shadow of a doubt that we do have a standard of good. It exists in any room. It ain't cool to punch a baby because of what we just know and we see in our everyday lives. We do have a standard of good. And because we can see and acknowledge, observe, and interact with our standard of good, there must be someone who created the standard. Otherwise, it's just my opinion against your opinion. And so if someone says, well, hey, if they're really, really skeptical, they might say, okay, yeah, but I can just be born with a natural sense not to hurt people and just be good. You know, I can tell good from bad. Why does that have to point to God? Why can't I just be born knowing good from bad? All right. If you want to try to take God out of being good, cool, fine. Here's the next thing for you. There's no way that good can exist without purpose. So if you think you're just born knowing good from bad and that eliminates God, okay. But good can't exist without purpose. And there certainly isn't purpose without God. How do you know that your quarterback of your team threw a touchdown or your quarterback threw an interception? How do you know which one's good and which one's bad? How do you know that when you're watching a football game? I know that if my quarterback, if Dak Prescott throws an interception, that's bad. If he throws a touchdown, that's good. How do I know that? Because I know the purpose of the game. Without knowing the purpose of the game, it's irrelevant. It's not good or bad. Good doesn't exist without the purpose. You got to know what the purpose is to even know what good is. And you can't know what the purpose is without knowing the guy that created the purpose. Without knowing God, there is no purpose. There's no purpose in your life without God. You can't say there's a right way to live and a wrong way to live it. And atheists and others will come against you and they'll say, they, are, they just know. How do you know? There's no standard. You have no purpose in your life. You can't know there's a right way to live it and a wrong way to live it. It doesn't even make sense to say that you can be good apart from God. Because it has no meaning apart from purpose. God has to be in the things that are good. Otherwise, it's your opinion versus the next guys. All right, last question. How could a loving God send someone to hell? I've gotten that question quite often. Some of y'all have gotten that question. So if I don't believe like you, do you believe I'm going to hell? Anybody ever got that question? Yeah. All right. Uh, first of all, okay, so if someone says, how can a loving God send someone to hell? What do you say? What do you mean? What do you mean by hell? Because we have these definitions of hell in our mind with the devil and pitchforks and flames and fire and all this stuff. But the definition of hell has been given to us. Paul, Paul described it in 2 Thessalonians 1. Paul refers to the, de the definition of hell as just simply separation from God. It's just separation from God. The people that are in hell are there because they don't want to be with Jesus. They're running from Jesus. And they've been running from Jesus their whole life. This author, Frank Turk, that I was reading recently, he goes around and he speaks to college campuses and stuff. And so atheists and things, they try to attack him. And this atheist said to him, an atheist said, my mother was a survivor of the Holocaust. She was presented with the gospel toward the end of her life and she rejected the gospel. And then she died. Is my mother in hell right now? Now that is straight up right to your face. This aggressive atheist is asking you to your eyeballs if his mother is in hell and Dr. Turek said I don't know where your mother is, this is a great answer check this out, I don't know where your mother is maybe she had the deathbed conversion but if she did not have the deathbed conversion to Christ then God is too loving to force her into heaven against her will what a great answer 
He will not force anyone to spend eternity with him if all they've done their whole life is reject him. We don't think of it that way, though, do we? We assume everybody wants to go to heaven. No, they don't. Jesus is in heaven, and people have been running from Jesus their whole life. How can a loving God send someone to hell? Well, he doesn't. People choose that. People choose to be reconciled with Jesus and coming to his, come into his presence, or people choose to reject Jesus and be separated from him. People make that choice. God doesn't make that choice for you. He loves you enough to allow you to love him because that's the only place in which you get true love. If you're allowed to love and have free will, you're also allowed to reject him. And that's the consequence that he's willing to accept. He made a way for every single one of us, no matter what your sin has been in your life, to be reconciled with him and be reconnected with God, not by anything that you do, not by being Mr. Good Boy or Mr. Good Girl, but because he sent Jesus Christ to pave the way for you to get back to God and have a direct connection and to grow in your spirit and to have all your sin wiped away. The Bible says it's really simple. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. We have all sinned. And the penalty of that sin is hell. It's, it's death. It's separation from God. The penalty of your sin is eternal separation from God. But God so loved the world that he sent his son Jesus to take your place for your punishment. Whoever believes in Christ will not perish by death and separation into hell, but will have everlasting life and be in the presence of the King. That while we were still sinners, while you're still nasty and ornery and ugly and funky and sinful and lustful and hateful, while you're still all that, he said, I'll die for that one. All you have to do is say, thank you. I'll take it. People say, but I don't deserve it. You're right. You don't. So don't worry about it. He gives it to you even though you don't deserve it. Oh, but I can't forgive myself for what I did. You blasphemer because God forgives you. How dare you to think that your opinion of you is greater than God's opinion of you. Forgiveness is when we get reconciled with the Lord. You forgive who hurt you and you forgive yourself for hurting others. And God says, I've been waiting on you. Come on. So if that's you in here today and you would like to make it right with the Lord, and this isn't just to respond to, if anybody is not a Christian, sure, that is for you. If you've never made God Lord of your life, but you want to make God Lord of your life, because that's when you get the power to have these compelling conversations with people. If you want to make God Lord of your life, I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that right now. But it's also for anybody that just, man, you just need to reconnect with the Lord. Maybe you've been away from the Lord for a minute, but you heard something today that makes you go, man, I got to get back right with God. He's made a way for me to do it, and I've been rejecting Him. I've separated myself from Him. And you're ready to end that today? I'm going to pray for you. Both of those categories, which might include everybody in this room, I don't know. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to ask you just to stay in your seat. And in just a minute, we're, we're going to bow our heads and close our eyes. And the reason why we do that is because it's just between you and God. Don't be looking around at anybody else and what anybody else is deciding. And it also, when we close our eyes, it gets rid of all distractions so that our focus can just be on God. And I'm just going to have you stand, I mean, sit in your seat. And then if this prayer is for you, I'm going to ask you to stand up. That ain't so hard, is it? I'm going to ask you to stand up. Will people see that you're standing up? Yes. Will they know? Oh, no. He needed to be reconciled with God. Oh, she needed to get right with God. <gasps> so what? 
Don't be ashamed of God before man. He certainly isn't ashamed of you before his Father. When you say yes, Lord. All right. All right. When you stand up, you're making a public declaration. This message meant something to me, God, and I'm not ashamed to say, I'm here. Have your way with me. That's what we're going to do. All right, everybody, let's bow our hearts, bow our heads, and close our eyes. Lord Jesus, we praise you for this message. Thank you for moving us into spiritual maturity. Thank you for growing us together. Thank you for the divine words that you spoke into our ears today, into our hearts today. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you give us this revelation. We praise you, Lord. Lord God, I pray right now that you just begin to tug on the hearts of folks that have never made you Lord of their life. Church, speak directly to you. If that's you and you're in here today and you're like, man, I've, I don't know for sure that I'm going to heaven. I, I don't know. I need to make Jesus Christ Lord of my life. I've heard enough. I want that. And you want to be a Christian and be welcomed into the family that is heavenly royalty. This is your moment. And all you have to say is, bow, all you have to do is bow your hearts and surrender. And I'll lead you through this prayer. But you do have to say it. I can't pray for you. You have to say it. You can say it in the privacy of your heart or you can say it verbally with your lips. But this is you telling God something like this. And don't say it if you don't mean it. But if your heart is soft and you're ready to make that decision, just repeat some, Repeat after me in, in your own words or exactly. It doesn't matter. It's more of a heart issue. But just tell Jesus, say, Lord Jesus, I have messed up in my life. I'm a sinner. And I'm tired of being a sinner. I want freedom from that sin. Thank you for making a way for me to get back to my Father, my Creator, the truth. God, I choose you today. Please forgive me of my sins. Wash me clean. Make me new. I stand on the promises of your word. In Jesus' name, thank you for making me a Christian. Hallelujah. My church family, everybody keep your eyes closed and we're, we're going to stand all together here in just a second but if you have just prayed that prayer don't stand up but just we lift your hand in the air so that I can see you and know who to pray for amen amen praise God all over the room praise God praise God praise God praise God hallelujah man thank you all over the room praise God all right you can put your hands down thank you Lord Jesus for those like we sang earlier this morning hell lost another one because I'm free. Church family, I'm going to continue to pray for everyone else. You might have already made Jesus Lord of your life at some point, but you know that you have separated yourself from him. You have not been connecting with him like you should. And this message did something for you, and you want to make that right today. This one is for you. Just pray. You can pray in your own words, or you can follow, follow what I'm saying. But don't pray it unless you mean it, unless your heart is soft and you're ready to get rid of that separation and get back to your Father. Just say, Lord Jesus, thank you for giving me chance after chance after chance. I know I don't deserve you, but you're holding out your hand anyway. And I'm taking it today. Forgive me, Lord for separating myself from you. Forgive me, Lord, for believing the world's way and being more a part of the world than I am a part of you. But that stops today. Lord Jesus, I commit to you. I dedicate my life to you. I lay myself down before you and I surrender. Not my will be done, but your will be done. Thank you for making me new. 
thank you for guiding my steps. Thank you for cleaning me today and giving me strength, power, and mercy to me when I don't deserve it. Thank you, God. I choose you. Come back into my heart and be Lord of my life. My eyes will be forever fixed on you. In Jesus' name, hallelujah, hallelujah. Church family, if you prayed with me, if you prayed any of those prayers, will you stand to your feet so that I can pray over you and we can thank the Lord. Stand to your feet right now. Stand to your feet right now. If you prayed any of those prayers, church family, can we give God a hand clap of praise? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Stay standing, please. Stay standing. Stay standing. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Church family, I just I want to thank y'all for responding to God in your unique way. Father God, you see all of us standing, and I wasn't ever sitting, but if I was sitting, I promise you I would have just stood up with you. Because there are things and ways in my life that I, I, I haven't connected with God the way that I know that I should. There are some things that I've been a little outside and need to get back inside. Thank y'all for being bold and making that declaration. God bless them in Jesus' name. Bless them. Lead them, encourage them, guide them, show them, teach them, love on them. I pray that all of you have a, a washing, a deluge, just all the water of heaven just being dumped out on you all at one time that just washes you so clean, gives you all the power and the strength that you've ever thought about having. God, light them up in that capacity. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. May God forever shine his face upon you and give you grace and give you peace. May he make himself known to you every day this week, greater and greater and greater. As you seek him, you will find him. You will grow when you spend time in the presence of the king. One last thing. Church family, y'all can open your eyes. If your eyes are still closed, thank y'all. You can open your eyes. Let's all stand and close out if you stood for either of those prayers I want to invite you to pray with some folks you don't have to pray with some folks but I want you to to invite you to pray with some folks we have an altar team go ahead brother Ray and our altar team they're coming up right now and they're going to line up in front of this stage if you would like to pray with someone about your dedication your declaration I would invite you to come and, and just seal it with somebody. It doesn't have to be a long prayer or anything, but just let somebody else. It's very important God talks to us about praying with people and not just by yourself. You're supposed to pray by yourself too, but also with, with folks as well. You experience healing, the book of James says, when you pray along with people. Let folks be a part of your prayer and your journey, all right? And they can also, if anybody needs it, they can also point you in the right direction, how to read the Bible, what to do next, how you can plug in at, at our church, what different things we have to offer, different classes and Bible studies. They can point you in the direction of being a disciple. Don't just let this be a day where you had a light switch go off and then the world just darkens it every day as you live. But get discipled so that you know what it means to be a man, a a man or a woman of God. All right, if, if you gave your heart to Jesus for the very first time, though, I'm not going to invite you up here. I'm going to very, very highly, highly encourage you, please come up here when we dismiss here in just a second and let them pray with you over that and defend against the world coming against you. Praise God. Amen. I'm, we're going to dismiss here in just a second, and we've got our growth track two happening in there. Uh, if you want to be dismissed and go on about your day, you're welcome to do that. And if you need special prayer, we got a saying here at Revive. If you need special prayer, come get you some. Don't walk out of the house of prayer without getting some prayer. Don't leave here without getting what you came here for. You got up and came to church this morning for something. Hopefully you got it. If you're still a little short of it, don't leave here without getting what you came to get. Let God invade your life and watch him raise up an army of Christians that invade the world and grow his kingdom. Father God, we love you and we praise you. We honor you in Jesus' mighty, holy, and precious name. One more time, all God's children said, amen, amen, amen. Let's give him one more hand clap of praise. Thank you, Father God. We love you in Jesus' name.
guys Amen. so much for watching this video. I hope it blessed you. If it did, consider sharing this. Share this with a friend. Send it on down the line so it can help and inspire somebody else and help us grow the kingdom of God. Also, you guys, do us a favor. Hit that subscribe button. When you subscribe to the YouTube channel, it grows it so more people see it. And also hit the notification thing so whenever we upload new stuff, you're the first to be alerted so we can continue to lift one another up. Iron sharpens iron and we continue to grow the kingdom of God. Thank you guys so much once again for watching this video. Y'all have a blessed day.